Hello and welcome to 31st lecture of course on data enabled tribological engineering from experiments to predictive model. Title of this lecture is prediction of coating and surface treatment performance. We have covered a number of times this topic in uh, my view particularly that there are major breakthroughs which have occurred in a surface engineering and coating technologies which is very good news for the tribologist. Now, coding can be customized to meet the growing demand for the multifunctional tribological application with a remarkable hardness, increased resistance to the wear and scuffing and providing gliding surfaces. Such coating performs well in the presence of even low viscosity lubricant therefore, provides a hope to reduce the sulfur and phosphorus additives which are very harmful to the environment. Similarly, surface technologies such as the laser texturing, dimpling and short painting have gained popularity in recent years. Surface engineering offers to combine a cost effective substrate with a coating possessing excellent mechanical and chemical properties. In other words, coatings are highly effective in modifying surface properties. However, as coating and surface treatment pertains to the nano to micro tribology, there is a need to predict the failure of the coating, which may occur due to substrate crack, coating degradation, loss of adhesion between the coating and substrate, coating getting affected by environment and fails to fulfill its intended function. Therefore, the need of prediction of coating and surface treatment performance emerges, which is the main goal of the present lecture. Before starting lecture, let me cover what we have already explain in terms of coating in various lectures. In lecture 12, we mentioned very clearly even the soft metal coating can enhance the surface life by 20 percent and these coatings can be something like a thicker coating. We also understood there is a coating some sort of a mark that if the thickness of the coating is lesser than 15 micron, this coating can be treated as a thin coating. If thickness of the coating is more than 15 micron it can be treated as a thick coating and in thin coating we also study something like a PVD layers and this example was covered particularly for piston rings and all these diagram have been picked up from a literature I have not drawn any diagram. One more thing which we have learned in the lecture 14 that we have a many many type of the different kind of coating materials and as well as a process. One important point which was mentioned in lecture 14 also, when we do this kind of a soft coating, what is the meaning of the soft coating which is a like a made of a solid materials or which is a working as a solid lubricant. If we go ahead with that, so the performance comparison was shown here, here in this case without any solid lubricant like MOS2 as a coating, we get some performance. The performance gets better for the ball bearing when as a MOS2 is a spurred on the balls, the performance almost 2 to 3 times improved. When we go with the sputtering of MOS2 on the races and cages, but leaving the balls as it is, then performance is increasing almost 10 times. Now, when we are going with the sputtering of the MOS2 almost on every element, performance increases significantly. And that is why we say the coating is very very important in these days. Coating with a thin lubricant, low viscous lubricant may be giving a good result. Why we are talking about the lubricant just to provide a cooling, to take away the wear debris. So, those things are important. As I mentioned there are two type coating, we say the one is a soft coating particularly hardness of the soft coating will be lesser than 10 gigapascal and hardness of the hard coating will be more than 10 gigapascal. Of course, there is a little bit variation from one book to other book. We will stick to the, this kind of uh, classification. Now, when we are saying very clearly when the, even the uh, substrate can be soft and we go with a better coating and we have given also some example if I can make a polymer which is much easier to manufacture and I do a some sort of a copper coating on that is a relatively hard it will provide a good performance to us. So, now with coating technologies even the substrate materials can be cost economic. We do not have to always think about a steel as a substrate material we can choose a very low cost uh, products which become a cost effective in the long run. However, there is a one major issue that is uh, 
we do not have reliable analytical as well as the numerical prediction models. So, that is why we are aiming for the machine learning models. Let me cover one example uh, which was published in 2008. The title is clearly the same the way our title of our uh, lecture is a predicted tool for design of erosion resistant coating. So, here we are treating erosion itself as a part of a uh, wear phenomenon. What they have shown very clearly that as a coating thickness increases, erosion resistance increases which in most of the coating is a reverse. Many times we say that as a coating thickness decreases, its wear resistance will increase. The question comes why? Then this is a coming a particle because in erosion is a third body particle. If the third particle diameter or radius is on a higher side, naturally it will completely scrap the coating itself. So, that is why they have used the word something like a thicker coating and there is a trend now depending on a situation we can choose thinner coating or thicker coating depends on the kind of the application. Of course, in this paper they have shown a wear volume will be related to the uh, particle uh, size, hardness, coating thickness, Young's modulus, impact velocity, particle density, fracture toughness. So, there are already 7 parameters in that. On top of that, because this is a proportionality constant, so you require a, some sort of a constant also, which can be obtained using the experiments. This is a major issue. Most of the such relations are empirical in the nature, may not work for the all situation. Like in this case, particularly you have shown velocity power 2.3, so this is a power law, while radius effect is 3.13, which is a much higher side. Even if I assume it is a spherical, it should be 3 only. However, they have shown a 3.13, density is a proportional, Young's modulus is a proportional. Now, here the question comes, we are improving the Young's modulus, we are increasing the Young's modulus, but wear volume is increasing. So, this is also important. Second comes the hardness, generally we use an Archer equation, simple inverse relation, while in this case power is a 2.5. That means, hardness is going to be much more sensitive parameter and one more parameter comes as the fracture toughness. So, this is very important. Now, that is why the major question comes, so which equation should be trusted? There are so many equations in a literature, what do we do? That is why we are saying better we grasp all the knowledge from the literature, give this equation as a elementary data to the ML and perform experiment so that we get a much more robust data. From that point of view, ML algorithm will remain same across uh, all the industries, but maybe whatever the parameter, whichever the training data they are getting based on that the formula will change, but algorithm will remain same. So, that is much more important to understand. We also understood uh, something like a thin coating and thick coating. And I will say the DLC is a one of the coating which is a very popular. Earlier we had a lot of flaws, cracks in a DLC coating, but the day by day those problems have been overcome. So, that is why we say a DLC coating is uh, going to be very important in our future. Now, it is amorphous, not a, like a graphite. Often people will come confused that DLC coating is a, like a graphite. Is no, most of the time graphite is SP2. Uh, one while uh, the diamond is sp3 bond while dlc is a combination of this so again we don't have a one dlc coating it can be thousand dlc coating depends on how we want to go ahead so this is very important not only this further dlc with the hydrogen dlc without hydrogen again there is a category and performance will change based on this However, we understood very clearly if we the DLC is being utilized or maybe coated properly, then it will show excellent tribological properties which are a low friction and low wear rate and excellent mechanical properties also related to high hardness and high Young's modulus also. We also covered in lecture 20th somewhat database which uh, was given by author and they try to go ahead with the tribological properties of data, DLC coating and comparison with the test results. They explored something like a 49 variables, I mean, variables are very many, many. 
they survey roughly 800 type of the coatings. But what was their conclusion? Conclusion is that the coated data or data which are available in literature, they don't show the consistency and there is a need to change the way it has been done. But now in ML, we have a partial domain uh, algorithms. That means I don't really require all the data from one literature. We can combine, we can go ahead with 800 uh, to 1000 uh, papers and we take a partial partial information from each which is going to be giving a much more robust uh, ML algorithm. After that we need to do verification by conducting experiments that is a future and that is why we are thinking that it will come in this form. Now based on that we can think about the thin coating or th uh, thick coating. And one more parameter comes, we say whenever the surface roughness is on a higher side compared to the thickness of the coating that will be major issue. So, surface roughness always need to be lesser than thickness of the coating. So, if coating is a 1 micron, naturally surface roughness has to be in a nanometer level. Another one as we have shown in the previous slide, particle size matters a lot. When particle size is uh, from uh, foreign particles, then we can use a filter. But if there is a debris generation and particle size itself is a big, naturally it will remove the coating. So, we need to have a good control on a wear debris particle. We can go ahead the smaller particle size but not bigger size particle. For that purpose, we really require the design. So, when we are discussing something like a coating and surface engineering, it does not mean only the coating with a thin coating. We need to look at completeness or we need to go ahead the compressed manner. When we come uh, think about comprehensive manner, we really require all the guidelines which we already have learned in a, our previous lectures. What we learn in a lecture 4, something like a wear particle and how the wear particle because of addition comes and a much bigger particle comes, it has been it was demonstrated and we took example of the 4 ball tester and we showed very clearly a big uh, chunk has been removed from a balls. Particle size will be much bigger. What is the hypothesis? We say very clearly because of the SPD which come in a contact and there is addition, there is a possibility of the transfer of the material from material 1 to material 2. That is what has been first shown and subsequently there may be transfer of other material if of course we have a keeping the same hardness. And subsequent to that we know very well there will be lump formation and after lump formation there will be a surgering of this lump and then it will become a particle. Now this particle can be flat. It can be spherical, it can be a combination of flat and spherical, it can be like a long chip and those particle sizes also have been discovered or may be discussed in our previous lectures. Then we have mentioned about the surface roughness, we say that surface roughness 0 should not be kept, reason being addition will increase significantly. Now we require some surface roughness, what is the meaning of that? That where we, we discover something like a direction, we say that if the surface roughness is a parallel to the sliding motion, that may not be giving a good results to us. However, if the surface roughness is a perpendicular to the sliding direction, it will give a good results. Why? Reason being if the oil is there and it is getting squeezed out easily, leaked out easily, the lubricant is not performing well. When it is coming the perpendicular direction, lubricant which is a, you know, because of the sliding it should move in this direction and because of the surface roughness the pockets are created and well, oil remains there which is like a surface texturing. So, that is a preferable and one more option was that cross run. This is also ok, this will give the best result, this will give average result, this will give a wrong results and multi direction we may not really require, it may not give a sufficient pocket, may not give a sufficient pocket to absorb or keep a debris in this. However, there was another one uh, principle also with what we say the texture surface with a weightability uh, negligible that may be the it should not spread on a surface itself. That means we really require texturing of a surface in a manner that the oil remains on the surface, it does not uh, spread on easily. If the oil remains on the surface, naturally it will provide a much more support to the load, and that was mentioned, and that is why we have given emphasis the surface texturing should be there reason being it is going to change the contact mechanics and then we say the small surface uh, characteristics like a grooves. So, not only the only this kind of pattern even this pattern is also important 
or maybe the dimples uh, maybe there is and dip portions can retain the lubrication reduce friction reduce corrosion reduce wear and extend the life span by maintaining the ultra low wear rate now we have option we can go for surface texturing or we can go ahead with a good surface finish in a proper direction these are the both options available finally naturally it has to be done a final operation on a manufactured surface if the surface is manufactured we are going to for the final cleaning operation we can go ahead with this kind of a super grinding or maybe say grinding kind of the super finish operation or we can go for the surface texturing is up to us how do we want to go ahead when we discuss the surface texturing then again the major question comes i am thinking about texture but what do i do now question comes very clearly that what is the particle size now we find uh, some particle size more than 100 micron some particle size range in between 40 to 60 micron or uh, 60 to 100 micron and some particle remain even the lesser than 40 micron and slightly above more than 40 micron question comes if i go with a single hole a uh, similar kind of pattern will it be sufficient and analysis says now that is not sufficient we need to have a variety we need to have a smaller size we need to have bigger size particles also um, say the textured surface also now whether it should be uh, circular or elliptical elliptical have a naturally always a much more advantages compared to the uh, circular one now the next question comes pattern should be in this manner or in this manner so that can be optimized you know we when we are even thinking about just a surface texturing we have uh, so many options and there is a no design equation it has to be done by design of experiments that's a major issue whenever we are going in depth of a tribology number of parameters are increasing significantly when the number of parameters are increasing significantly conventional a method or conventional tribology cannot be used that's why we are thinking about artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms we also discussed uh, this slide their time we say very clearly even though we are assuming that uh, this texture surface will be a good shape the bottom is blind but what we have always realized that texture surface come finally like something less so again analysis is missing and this is a highly statistical so the mean value and standard deviation are comparable i mean we will not get a robust results from this this is what we say holes are created by stopping laser beam at a specific location and a specific number of pulses another one what should be the distance between the two textured holes or maybe dimples in the situation again it has to be optimized we know very well if overall textured surface is a more than 15 percent it may deteriorate the performance it may not enhance the performance again this optimization factor also need to be there and this is a valid for all that's why we say dimples grooves pattern can affect the direction of lubricant flow and ability to capture the wear debris it has to be done and if we go with the more and more dimples or the grooves it will deteriorate the performance and that we need to keep in mind so we don't have a design equation that's why we need to move to design of experiment so the design of experiment that has been already discovered or maybe detailed in a lecture 19 we also mentioned very clearly that we need to think about uh, very carefully because ANOVA itself has a drop there's another option because we are talking about the coating and we are talking not only thinner coating we are also talking about the surface structuring naturally it will be thicker coating so why not we think about advancement in a laser based coating we are using the word laser based because the texture most of the surfaces are laser it can be chemical but most popular is a laser based texture so now we are thinking about laser based coating why do we first coat and then remove from a laser why not directly we coat the textured surface on the surface itself that's an important aspect so that's why we say advancement in the laser based coating for the surface engineering and material processing that is what upcoming area we do not have a sufficient literature available however we say very clearly if the thinner coating is sufficient we should go with the dlc which is giving good performance that's what we are saying widespread adoption of the dlc underscores are the that gives a maximum weightage that recent progress in a carbon based coating and it provides a exceptional frictional characteristics coupled with a superior wear resistance 
So any day we can go with a DLC that's going to give a very good results. But if you are planning to go with a surface texturing or similar kind of processing, then we, I will believe that laser based coating will provide a better results. So what we say laser based process offers precision control over the parameter enabling the development of advanced coating with enhanced properties primarily concentrating on capabilities to enhance surface functionality and durability which is our main aim. Now there are a number of advantages for the laser based coating. We say advantages are we are providing only limited heat that means thermal expansion or increase is not happening that fast. And when we say constrained heat input, we are not really distorting the surface bigger way and then reducing number of faults because many times the coating faults or delamination of coating occurs because of the crack salinity and based uh, when you go for the laser based coating that number of faults can be decreased. Next one is a coaxial injection which we also have used wherever the laser is impinging and powder comes at that position it can really do a melting and solidification much faster pace. We may not really require too much cooling that time. So this is very important. So using coaxial injection method, laser beam and wherever we can also inject from angular side, maybe 5 degree, 10 degree, 15 degree depends on the powder size and uh, whatever we want. This gives an efficient transport of a powder which can be alloyed and then it will uh, give a deposition of the laser material as well as we can utilize a ceramics also because ceramic coating is one of the major requirement but we do not have improved uh, this methods or technologies that is why we are finding a little difficulty to functionalize the produce surface. Now new multi layer laser based technique have been devised to minimize stresses, improve addition to substrate, achieve harder and smoother surface thus optimizing design in terms of friction and wear. So this laser based coating is a future and then we should uh, work more and more and maybe I am assuming 5 to 10 years may be quite possible all the surfaces can be replaced. Of course uh, this uh, DLC has already been popular so we need to think what we want and how do we want. Whatever we do thin coating or thicker coating we need to characterize that and we need to evaluate the performance. Characterization from coating, what is the meaning of that? We need to think about what is a structure, what kind of coating material we are using, is a homogeneous, is a heterogeneous and how do we apply it, what kind of a process we are using, are we thinking about the thickness 1 micron, 15 micron, 30 micron, 50 micron, what will be the operating temperature and what should be the micro harness, this is a very important to evaluate. In lecture 19, as we say that very clearly that we use a design of experiment because we do not have exact relation and what we were trying to figure out what will be the friction coefficient if we are using graphene as a nanoparticle or RGO as a nanoparticle, MOS2 as a nanoparticle or SBN as a uh, nanoparticle because we do not have any equation available on this mathematical formulas are not there. So what we did, we did, we did a design of experiment and giving different different percentage of graphene, different percent of the RGO, different percentage of the MOS2, different percent of HPN and then we perform experiment and we try to figure out which is a more sensitive parameter and we found MOS2 turn out to be most uh, important parameter particularly for giving a low coefficient of friction and then that is why we can go hard with this kind of uh, powder. But again, we understood there are limitations, we have a limited data and that is what we mentioned that time that limitation of ANOVA and requirement of ML and again we are bringing ML here to think about the coating. So what was mentioned that time ANOVA cannot accurately predict optimal conditions, multiple iterations are required to predict the optimal condition, we do not have sufficient data. Even in sufficient data again we need to go with a fixed set of formulas, it cannot be so flexible. But machine learning algorithm enhance optimization by systematically exploring multiple combination of the components are labeled. So we make a model then we do also a lot of simulation and maybe a subset of that can be verified using experiments but ANOVA does not have that kind of options. So what we are seeing the techniques such as the grid search, random search, I prefer random search because uh, grid search also requires a good formula and then if it is we do not have then there is a problem. 
or evolutionary algorithm like a genetic algorithm can be used in this case to define whatever the minimization goal or minimization of friction and wear goal. Machine algorithms can uncover relationship between input and output variables. This is a major, major, major contribution of ML. Other algorithms say what is the relation? Based on that, we will start. In this case, ML says that you give me the data, I will establish a relation between input and output. And then once we have a relation uh, which we covered after the optimization is not that difficult and we can uh, define the ranges, we can optimize the uh, results. Now, when we think about the prediction of the thin film coating, we say we need to think about uh, equipment, analytical equipment and most of the equipments are offline. We do not have in line, we do not have online equipments. And what are the these equipments which are available offline? We use generally the TEM transmission electron microscope that is for the thin film coating or we use a AFM. This has been also covered in our earlier lecture. We also emphasize there is a need to improve the production technique using in situ measurement because TAM and AFM can be used only offline and again there are limitations the specimen size should be this much it cannot be this manner. So that is why there is a need to enhance in situ measurement and take a decision there itself that will help us to provide a better prediction and that is what uh, we are trying to address in present lecture. Now coming to the coding parameters and how do we combine ANN with that? We say there are number of type of the coatings to select the coating material we can use ANN which we have already also learned earlier that we can use a mathematical model. What is the compatibility of substrate material and coating that again literature is there we can have a data and we can establish relation. Different environmental condition again we can do this kind of a ANN can be applied for that. Even the choosing the process to apply coating can be done and choosing for the intended usefulness or maybe function that also can be done. So ANN can be utilized for every case choosing the type of the coating, uh, choosing the compatibility with uh, some substrate material with a defined uh, substrate material is there we can think about which coating should be utilized. I mean under different environment condition which coating, coating will be useful. Uh, how to connect the parameters or materials with uh, process parameter also can be done properly and then functionality those things can be done. Next one is coming the substrate material naturally here whenever we have substrate material what are the processes which need to incorporate just like we require some sort of surface preparation and this brings another aspect to us many times we are saying to improve surface roughness, go hard with the lapping, go hard with the super finish operation. Now here when we are coming with the coating and we have already material and then do we really require again surface preparation? If it is we need to think, if it is not we can directly deposit that will be important. So this is what we require to ensure the proper addition between coating and substrate we can think about surface preparation and uh, what kind of a level of the preparation is really required. What are the factors in this case? What is the surface roughness? Here a rough surface will be more beneficial. A rough surface of the substrate material will be much more beneficial. Is it really clean? It has been the oil has been removed. It will decrease or not. That is important than what is the compatibility with the coating. So this also can selection can be done with the ANN. There is no problem. As I mentioned the environmental condition it can be temperature fluctuation, tem uh, humidity even one is a UV exposure what is a ultraviolet exposure to that material and whether the material will over the 5 years, 3 years will get damaged that is important. Is it really in a corrosive environment? Is it under very high mechanical stresses? Now here depending, depending on the kind of uh, environment we also can go ahead with a different kind of experimental setups because different different experimental techniques are available which will be suitable for this. So present uh, what we are mentioning here in our present uh, lecture will be more emphasis given on the mechanical stresses. Major the um, output will require is a long term performance 
this is what we say the application where the coating is being applied with a by spring, by brushing, by rolling, by dipping that is very very really required how do we control the thickness that is important and finally comes uh, what kind of curing process is being followed and what is the drying time in presence of humidity. Now, these three are very very important from our point of view we want quality control, we want appropriate testing and evaluation and then we also require a maintenance and inspection. So, first thing is that how to apply coating. Then once our coating has been applied, I am choosing a process parameter. After that, whatever the coating has come, what is the testing, what kind of evaluation is there and finally comes the maintenance. So, ANN also helps in all this. So, what we can say ANN can be applied at various stages of coating life cycle. It can help us in the formulating the design it helps in the preparation of the process, it can be helping also in application. So, ANN can be utilized in almost every level. What we have covered also in the lecture 15 is something like AFM and then uh, what we said that we have shown very clearly that AFM works can optimize maybe the non-contact uh, mode of AFM, we can capture the 3D image of a coated surface at the nano scale and then uh, it can really detect the friction force as well as a wear related thing that is also possible. Coming to the TAM which is a just basically based on the electron scattering and absorption of with the samples. It provides a better advantage compared to the SCM and optical microscopy. This is a very important and what we are trying to figure out is something what will be the characteristics of the coating and what will be the thickness. And then if this is a done by AFM and a SE and a TAM, then we will call this as a offline. But what we are looking forward is online are we able to monitor this online. So, if it is online which is a future then it will be very good. Like in this case we have shown even the nano level the graphene thickness something was around 1 nanometer and it was in sheet form when it gives a spread on the surface it gives a very good results. But if comes in a bulky form then it becomes a abrasive material and it gets damaged. So, when we are going to nano or micro tribology level careful implementation of science is important. If you are reading sometime, yeah, graphene is giving the best result. That may not be necessary in every situation, depend what kind of percentage or what is the concentration which we are using. Sometime graphene at a low percentage gives a far better results compared to higher percentage. So, those things are important. Of course, it has been already addressed in our previous lectures. So, what we say artificial neural network, now we are bringing another aspect that is a non-destructive testing because we have a sensor, we are capturing the signals, we are processing those signals and we are trying to predict those. So, we may not require a time, we may not require AFM in a future. If we are able to improve these techniques directly in house or in situ manner and how the ANN will help, it can do a performance testing, it can provide us some sort of a service life also. Reason being performance testing, we are able to evaluate energy level, we are able to find what is the contamination level, we are able to find out the some model and then if it has done something like in 1000 hours, whatever the performance, what will happen in 10,000 hours, what will happen after 100,000 hours or we can modify also process parameters. So, that is possible in this. In this now, we say when we are going ahead with experiments, ANN we record experimental uh, results also and ANN try to bridge a gap between the known factor and experimental results. That means, whatever the relations which we are using at the in beginning level that can be improved and then uh, it can really based on those analysis tool or mathematical model it can be improved. So, this is what we say we can think about the predictive model in a better form. Now, we can do integration with any entity non destructive testing again we are not going with a destructive testing we are going only with a non destructive testing there are many type of non destructive testing even in one of the earlier slide i mentioned i have also eight uh, video lectures on uh, ndt which are available in youtube in this case in present lecture we are just thinking only about acoustic emission technology infrared is one of the very strong technology uh, ultrasound technology is also important however we are present lecture we are not covering this but if you will go through literature we can find out the case studies related to all three 
In present lecture, we are just focusing only on a caustic emission and we are thinking about when mechanical load is applied or removed or caustic load is applied, how do we uh, acoustic uh, emission technology provides a better results to us. So, what is the acoustic emission uh, non destructive testing? We say it thinks it works on elastic waves or particularly in the waves which travel in elastic material. So, we say release of the transient elastic wave produced by localized source within a material. So, this uh, we give us some sort of uh, waves pass through the material and we detect also. We, we use generally two sensor of course, the one sensor also can be utilized in this purpose, but we use generally two sensor we give the signal and how it is really moving uh, through the material we get the monitor those results and based on that what is the output coming we try to discover the faults. It describes the faults, it can be flaws, it can be cracks by tracking the damage progression within the coating itself. So, this is important. If there are cracks, naturally the behavior of transmission will change and we need to keep a track of that. Similar thing have happens with the AFM and NetAM or SCM. They use some sort of source, they capture the signal, they analyze the signal. Similar things can be done in this manner. So, what we are saying sensor, we can say only sensors are typically uh, attached to the surface of the material for a, a e testing or acoustic emission testing. Again, now when we are talking about the attaching this sensor to surface, it matters. If this uh, acoustic sensor is very near to the fall, it will give very good results. It is far located some far away, it may not give a good results. So, we will just cover one example on that purpose and then we will show this is. And again, it has to be a 24 into 7 monitoring. It cannot be I applied only for 5 minutes and then I wait for the 2 hours and then again apply for 5 minutes and not. It has to be a continuous one and we need to collect and process the data appropriate manner and then uh, we say we are trying to identify initiation and development of faults in the straight components and this is what we say mechanical load has been applied and may be relieved depending on the rotation. So, detection is possible when a uh, component experiences the repetitive loading or continuous stress. If load is not repetitive or there is no continuous load then this kind of model may not be very useful. So, we say when material is subjected to strain or deformation elastic waves of a very high frequency again here you are using whatever we are not able to hear we are going beyond that frequency. So, frequency needs to be very high and that is a very important so, when frequency is very high that is why even smaller to smaller crack can be detected. This is what we say an AAE sensor can be detecting those things waves are detected analyzed to determine the source strength and frequency content of the transmitted uh, signals. So, this is what we are trying to uh, show the uh, one example. We say acoustic emission detection technologies the same thing but over in there it undergoes external uh, forces creates a local stress uh, basically local stress concentration and uh, create some sort of unbalance in the stress distribution. So, some places uh, there will be more stress, some places there will be lesser stresses. We are assuming that wherever there is a more stress crack will initiate there and that is where we are mentioning very clearly wherever there is a crack and then uh, creation what will happen energy will be released and part of the strain energy is released as elastic weight during the transition and that can be captured as a acoustic emission. So, whenever there is a crack some energy will be released because of the strain and that energy is what we need to capture and then figure out whether to the location of the crack. So, AE uh, signal can be categorized. Now, if it is a continuous type, no problem. If it is a bus type signal, then there is a problem, there is a possibility of some crack, of some discontinuity. What we say the continuous signal consists of low amplitude components, which we are not worried too much related to plastic deformation and uh, but bus type signals can sub the high amplitude component related to crack formation and fracture process. So, caustic emission is a good uh, way to detect uh, anything related to crack initiation and crack propagation and most of the time uh, when we are talking about the wear related phenomena crack has to be initiated it has to over propagate it and then finally come as a wear debris particle. So, this is what we mentioned very clearly and often this energy level or amplitude is given by the, this relation what is the A signal A has been shown here. Now, A 0 is basically amplitude of the source frequency of the signal which we are 
trying to capture it propagation velocity which again sensor can uh, find propagation distance traveled by this this is the iso so the, based on this what is already known f is known v is known q is given then they try to figure out what will be the displacement so the capturing signal and interpreting signal in terms of d is also possible let's uh, let me cover one example we say this is a of course this example has been picked up from uh, this literature we say there is a, a test rig having a back to back gear arrangement and uh, one uh, pinion has a 49 teeth gear has a 65 teeth and module is a 3 mm of course uh, generally we go with the pressure angle 20 degree but in this case they have kept 20.8 degree roughness is being kept on a higher side is something like a 2 to 3 micron which is much higher right they tested for the three torque levels three loading situation in one case almost zero uh, zero newton meter of course it cannot be zero absolutely because they need to run they need to rotate the shaft naturally there will be some torque but is a negligible and every time it will be deducted so we can treat this as a zero newton meter next one is a 55 newton meter and another one is a 110 newton meter and this is what they have shown that they try to capture the signal using two acoustic sensors. One sensor was directly capped on the gear, other sensor on a bearing housing. Now, what is a common mistake? Uh, most of the time, acoustic sensors have been fixed on the bearing casing. Bearing casing is being stationary. And here, they have used a sensor directly on the gear. So, when we use a directly sensor on a gear, transmission will not occur so easily so that's why we use a slip ring arrangement slip ring arrangement itself has its own noise level but with a good uh, data processing can be cancelled and then that's what we are here we again the frequency response they have been trying is of more than 100 kilohertz uh, 100 kilohertz to 1 megahertz that's a word with a gear doesn't have any fault just to uh, get a data they uh, mention very small pit on the pit circle diameter other one of the gear teeth other one is a serial fault of the bigger size and these are the thing when we they use a sensor and uh, one defect uh, the gear that is a 1 mm diameter and when they use this uh, serial fault it was a 12 by 3 mm uh, 3 mm is in uh, this side that means almost a one module and then uh, width is a 12 mm so this is what are the uh, addendum uh, they kept in uh, there sir so to remove the background noise this vibrate as i say mentioned that uh, they took uh, some observation the three observation were taken as i mentioned and every every case they operated this complete gear box for the 30 minutes so that we get a steady state condition it should not be transient condition gearbox was turned off uh, to get ready for the next reading and this turning off was roughly for the three times of 50 to 90 minutes and then uh, they have kept a sampling the uh, frequency as a 10 megahertz now what are the responses they have found the responses for uh, in the no load case of course this is a small pitch uh, defect but what, what was the diameter in the case kept was a 1 mm diameter now seeded fault they created a fall and then they are getting response when there is a no load we can see the amplitude we, there is a some load that's a 15.5 newton meter we can see the amplitude and when there is a 110 newton load again we can see the faults and they use this also region we say the very the fault fault comes over here that's a c position and the change in the behavior occurs before and the fault is approaching and even after the fault is uh, uh, moved away so both the cases that's why they use a three or uh, five categories c is basically at the, at the where the fault was created so that's what we are using the central region c where the seeded fault uh, you know, was kept or we've inserted it gives always the highest rms values now another thing comes in this case uh, when they were monitoring and as i mentioned the two sensors were mounted to figure out which sensor is giving better results now so in first case sensor is mounted on a gear of course slip ring arrangement has to be there second sensor has been loaded at the bearing piece now they are finding the much variation in a decibel level itself and then in one case it is a 44 decibel particularly when sensor is mounted on a gear and the other case it is a level is of 26 so there is a substantial decrease in a signal level so that's very important 
and then they give a blame to the bearing reason being bearing is not a continuous. Now, every bearing will have a some rollers or some balls and this there is a some gap and then this because of the cage it can the gap can be uniform also. Now, where is the problem coming because signal can be transmitted by the only bottom one that is what we have mentioned the location of the bearing ball or roller component during rotation can be blamed for the disc difference instead of 44 they are getting only 26 uh, using another similar kind of sensor theoretically transmission of the caustic emission burst to the sensor on a bearing case was only conceivable when ball or roller was at the bottom and this is what I am showing a red color when there is at the bottom this ball approaches then only we are getting signal once it has rotated by 1 degree naturally other ball is approaching but we will not get a signal and that this when we will get a signal only this so there is a some sort of delay in a signal instead of that if we keep a ball everywhere is something like a needle roller bearing then we may get a good response and so we get a far better results. Now, another thing they use uh, two sensor in one side uh, one, uh, one sensor other side other sensor that can be pre amplified and uh, kept on the computer this is what we show very clearly if sensors are uh, applied very close to the fault it is going to give a very good results. If it is away from a location magnitude also will, will decrease as well as the location also will not be very useful and that is what has been shown over here. Now one more important thing comes if it is the fault the sensor is very close to the fault even the initiation of the crack development of the crack and to a significant that this can be distinguished this is a what a major achievement even a similar kind of fault at the beginning subsequent progress and finally kind of the failure that can be distinguished and that is why we are using a word acoustic emission is going to give very good results for that purpose. Now, what they say initially the metal dissolution kind of the response which we will get will be different if there is a some sort of gas bubble release response which we are going to get to using the acoustic emission sensor it will be different. So, here it is anodic reaction here it is a cathodic reaction and if there is a breakdown of the oxide layer from a surface acoustic emission signal also will be different and this makes acoustic emission sensor very very useful for the condition monitoring or we say there for the uh, ML which we really get a really right signal and we can classify is the fault happening because of the breakdown of oxide layer is fault is occurring because of the evaluation or maybe say the gas evolving or it is because of the metal dissolution. So, we can pinpoint what kind of the fault we are getting and we can really do a right process parameter we can adjust process parameter right manner to avoid that kind of fault and that is a major uh, advantage of this. So, that is why we say specific a signal for the crack initiation and growth evaluation of the hydrogen bubble due to cathodic reaction breakdown of the thick surface oxide layer uh, particularly plastic zone and that will can be uh, in this case again there will be some sort of uh, uh, for the division uh, case possible is something like a uh, slip deformation, twinning, fracture, decohesion of the precipitation that is also possible. Now, this is a what they have shown in the diagram A, B, C, uh, A, B they are related that means whatever the, we are getting time signal we are converting to frequency signal time signal to the frequency signal and time signal to frequency signal and this first one is been shown very clearly is a, a typical a e waveform observed during the hydrogen gas evolution now this is a what frequency response we are getting based on this frequency response we are characterizing second one the b one this is what we say there is a rupture of the passive film that is the rupture of the passive film is also possible and that signal comes. Now, this uh, kind of R and D is very important of course, it is beyond the scope of uh, our present course, but this is a uh, possible by fine tuning and I think particularly physically field is really required for this kind of responses in analysis and that is what we are showing clearly here that uh, some uh, passive film uh, breakage comes at roughly at the 50 kilohertz anodic dissolution or cathodic occurs around 50 to 70 and uh, the, the, these responses are almost similar in this case uh, what we are getting uh, in the B case particularly uh, it is a much lower uh, C and D in this case we are getting passive level rupture 
at a lower magnitude while in this case we are getting a much higher magnitude. So, these are the comparable uh, results and we can uh, see by analyzing signal appropriately we can find out what kind of fault are there. One is the detection of the crack that acoustic emission signal can do it. But further going in the detail even the inception or creation or mechanism which is causing a crack to initiate, get initiated and propagate that also can be captured that is why this will be very useful to us. Now, one other one based on energy levels. So, there are two ways one is a AE heat energy other one is a cumulative energy both the can be plotted together and then we are able to see whether the crack is an initial stage stage 1 or is a stage 2 or a stage 3. So, here the stage 3 at least we can go ahead with the proper maintenance planning that as past as stage 2 that we really require to replace it or if it is the initial stage and then we really require to change it uh, then it also is possible to these things are uh, easy to detect using acoustic emission signals. Now, coming to the our prediction of the coating process what we as initially what we showed when the we are applying a some coating and some crack has initiated or progressing that is after coating or maybe the surface process has been completed. But even the during the process itself during coating process itself this uh, can be uh, utilized and as already we mentioned ANN also can be utilized for better purpose. And overall flow uh, chart has been shown over here and this paper is uh, this paper was published in 2021. We are able to see that one of the original signals and the signals have been broken in the two streams. One is a crack sig related signal, other one is a process related signal. Processes can be analyzed and again they have divided in a four to five categories. They utilize their own algorithm and then uh, tested those algorithm with a other uh, al algorithm. Here CNN is a, like a pre-trained algorithm which we also covered in our earlier lecture there are number of trainers in an algorithm they utilize that also. So, this is what they did it now we are trying to detail uh, what they did and how they have done it. So, what they say they apply the laser cladding that is a coating methodology advanced manufacturing process basically reason being that uh, uh, it, it melts and the fuse powder on the surface is like additive manufacturing and it has a control uh, or precision control it causes a minimum heat input uh, reduced uh, distortion and improved uh, coating properties also impossible in this case. So, now we will cover this process now what we as I mentioned it has uh, some outputs nothing there is no problem normal there is a some problem problem related to the laser power abnormality or laser power causing to the crack. Then one is scanning speed ab abnormality, scanning speed related to crack, powder uh, feeding abnormality or powder feeding to the crack, overlapping rate abnormality or overlapping rate of the related to crack, then cooling time abnormality or cooling time. So, what they did in this case in one they use a pre-train they have used all the data in one category. In other case they divide it and then use a two separate algorithm. One algorithm related to this orange color and other algorithm related to this red color outputs. So, these things are important to test. Now, what we are saying even one machine learning algorithm may not be sufficient. So, you give some data based on energy division to one algorithm supply other data to other algorithm and do overall analysis. So, the results are more fantastic or really useful to us. So, that is what they did. However, what challenges they are facing? We say challenges in the laser cladding is basically whenever you do this kind of additive manufacturing we are depositing then we find a some sort of cracks or possibility of delamination. Quality will be deteriorated and to improve this we really require a real time monitoring otherwise we will not be able to get a good results. What is the methodology basically? We try to get a captured acoustic emission signals and then based on that we divide it in two categories one is a detecting crack is a one category cladding state what is the process happening and what kind of process and whether we can use a process parameter or improve the process parameter that will come in a cladding state. And then uh, when you are monitoring the caustic emission during the cladding, uh, cladding process, it uh, helps us to optimize the laser power, it can optimize the scanning speed of uh, powder feed rate and minimize the crack occurrence also. So, this is uh, what uh, we have uh, parameters which can be tuned for the coating purpose. 
again if anything is causing a crack that need to be changed immediately so that coating whatever comes out it will be full proof one thing is that we can develop a coating first and then detect that is what the previous example we showed. The other one is that during uh, manufacturing or during coating process itself try to detect a crack and in addition try to optimize a parameter like a laser power scanning speed power powder feed rate so that we get a better coating. So, data uh, processing analysis can be done. You, they try to utilize a deep uh, neural network or we say we use they use a CNN of different levels so that overall uh, vital information can be captured. This is the overall setup they showed a laser cladding acoustic emission signal uh, acquisition system you are able to see the laser related device and uh, this is a coating or maybe the cladding is happening powder and then the way this moves this way or that way that is a relative speed they try to do a cooling immediately so that there should not be a much variation because of the powder and substrate will have a difference uh, in uh, expansion coefficient if we do cooling much faster then there will not be much problem and whatever they are acquiring acoustic signal that can be recorded so the simultaneous processing can be done so that's why we say acoustic emission signal uh, feature vector are extracted based on the maximum magnitude and power energy so there are two things one is the amplitude which we have shown in earlier one relation a is equal to a0 or maybe at and then power energy uh, is basically integration of a square so that can be done in this manner. So what we say in this case, a molten uh, pool undergoes a spontaneous cooling to form cladding layer with a high hardness, good thermal stability. This is what I mentioned because they have there is a change in the thermal coefficient. So we require immediate cooling, and if, it, if it, there is a immediate cooling, then we will get a good thermal stability. And then whatever we want, mechanical properties, physical properties, those can be tuned. And when we are checking AE signal can, uh, continuously then even optimizing uh, these parameters can be done properly or uh, how what kind of thickness and uh, what we say power density of uh, laser that can be used. The different cladding powder ratio to control uh, crack to port defect. Another one is that we try to give a feedback whatever you are getting we give a feedback it will make a much more control much better control system and that is possible when we are going to use ANN so that overall results are fine this is a ANN to identify acoustic emission signal during process itself so whenever there is a coating ANN signal is immediately get analyzing the acoustic signals and giving a feedback so that is why we say after identification of the crack and pores neural network helps to classify sample now, if we are not giving the feedback also, we are not improving it, if there is a crack, then at least it can be uh, segregated in different uh, basket depending on the what kind of the crack size is this ANN is able to predict. There are three uh, diagram has been shown, laser cladding equipment, acoustic emission signal acquisition and cooling devices, all three have been shown. What parameters they have selected which may not be directly related to us, but uh, and for completeness I am giving, they use uh, LDF 4000 to 4100 uh, laser device that can give the output as a continuous or pulse output mode. And of course, they use a wavelength in the range of 900 uh, nanometer to 1070 they use a laser head, they use a industrial robot, you can be able to see the industrial robot here, here. and then uh, which has a minimal position repeat error with the, to minimize the error uh, related thing and uh, they use a coaxial laser cladding head that is what we say nozzle many times it delivers a powder and uh, laser was uh, related to 6 kilowatt precision powder to focus. Powder delivery has been managed using the uh, negative pressure or some sort of suction pressure so that uh, accurate powder feeding is been done with the minimum error. They use acoustic sensors so that has been mentioned very clearly and then the frequency in this case they have showed 1 kilohertz to uh, 1 megahertz it can be 100 kilohertz also to 1 megahertz and then uh, this is a uh, they have uh, collected data on a PC then comes to the cooling device so that stable uh, the room temperature can be obtained in a very short span of time so that we do not get overall uh, uh, defects on a uh, coating. Now another one uh, this is uh, what they use a uh, two sensors they are saying the acoustic emission receiver source and then if there is a fault how it will scattering will occur and then have to be results can be uh, matched. But this is a little difficult uh, many time interpretation is not so easy 
and then there is a possibility of some sort of inconsistency so again and again we nearly required to be uh, to test this kind of uh, responses and then what we are saying uh, signal propagation occurs in this case because of the frequency propagation velocity distance quality factor which was discussed in a, one of our earlier equation and that is uh, what we really required we subsequent to this we really required signal preprocessing that uh, how do we know crack has been initiated how the grow what kind of growth is happening that's very important to understand so a a signal from a normal threading process without crack can exhibit different behavior and then what is a, that behavior see so normal signals whatever that we are getting something will be lesser than 0.05 so there is some sort of limit however if the crack is there this signal will increase significantly and maybe to now the 1.5 decibel so it is almost a 30 time higher side so this is the word common range naturally we need to when we are analyzing we need to keep signal is coming and what is the label and uh, there may be two categories kind of the initially big category i mean there will be the low amplitude and high amplitude that is, is the first one and then uh, coming to the frequency if this energy level comes initially lesser than 0.2 overall energy level but, but there is a crack it can go to 200 so that almost 1000 times increase and that is why they kept a threshold value of the 20 to investigate whether there is a crack or there is a no crack as such lesser than 20 no crack more than 20 will be crack so this is what the th uh, threshold needs to be kept that is why we say the signal with the energy greater than this threshold that is a 20 are defined as an abnormal signal generating cracks while those with a less energy below this are considered normal cladding process but again it can be divided in a 4 5 domains where the process uh, parameters can be improved in a diagram point of view they have shown something like this you can see with a crack they have done a, some sort of a normalization and the normalization for that purpose they have used uh, this min max uh, normalization and then uh, to calculate energy level even though both are the related but uh, if you look at this is amplitude related and this is energy related or the integration minus infinity to plus infinity that they are able to get pow power is energy and power are same in this case so here we are giving maximum limit as a 20 while in this case you can look at the 0 to 200 plus and we are getting response also at the different places and this is with a crack and this is a without crack and they are able to differentiate based on this without crack you can see here the energy level is roughly reaching the 12 level 12 something while in this case it can reach to the more than 200 also so identifying signal is uh, what is very important from acoustic emission signals do a post processing and immediately figure out what is a, whether there is a crack or not if there is a crack what is the source of those cracks that's also important they use a convolutional neural network and of course uh, in this case if they have shown very clearly we have uh, studied this cnn earlier in our uh, lectures and that there is a kernel and there is a filter and there is a, a pooling direction and they use uh, max pooling uh, layers which we have already covered and then the, this convolution layer also we have already covered and generally they use a sequence convolution layer pooling layer convolution layer pooling layers to their overall uh, size can be reduced and economized that way of course in that duration we will be losing some information but many times we do not worry about that information so convolution neural network has been utilized uh, basically to connect with local way and then uh, do a, some sort of a n n always find some, some sort of weights and then uh, we connect with uh, some neuron and a weight factor to get overall good results to us that has been also done in this manner so this is a convolution layer this is a pooling layer that's why we are saying convolution kernel slides along input layers performing vector operation with input signal resulting output are obtained through the activation function so they have also used a activation function mostly value function have been utilized by them creating a new layer as output layer coming to the pooling layer again they they use uh, filters uh, it can be used a 3 by 3 4 by 4 the way we have already discussed in our previous lectures that can be utilized to get overall uh, more meaningful features uh, basically the cnn has been used to extract the features and that's why the, this uh, tuning is really required and we really require number of experiments to be performed so that we get a good results now the, what uh, method they have utilized they are giving a name as a state recognition and crack defect uh, that is a srcd diagnosis model that is what they have suggested so instead of one cnn 
we use it to CNN kind of thing. That's what we over us in the start a cladding, obtain acoustic emission signals. That's a time series. And then uh, do the processing based on processing whether the high frequency or high energy or low energy. They divided in two categories high energy, low energy. Generally, they are treating high energy as a crack related because uh, low energy cracks will not come, but high energy crack will be coming. So, there is a separate network to diagnose the crack, there is a separate network to find out the state of the cladding. There is a cladding state uh, recognition network, that is why they use the word state recognition and crack defect uh, diagnosis model. This has been shown over here. Now, they are doing a data processing, they use a 1024 data based uh, signals. And then as I mentioned very clearly high energy signals uh, which will identify the crack diagnosis while low energy signals will give the cladding state recognition. Cladding state uh, recognition is basically is related to the parameter which need to be optimized what should be the laser power because that is very important. What should be the scanning speed at what speed the deposition rate should be there. What should be the powder feeding rate. Now to improve the coating these things are very important. How much power, how fast melting is required? If it is, then is this really causing more harm to the substrate that need to be analyzed also. Similarly, scanning speed is also important, powder feed rate is also important and these are very very essential for the uh, additive manufacturing and they are able to utilize a signal to optimize those parameters. Then coming to the crack diagnosis, we say crack diagnosis network are designed to diagnose possible crack utilizing distinct features. As I mentioned in the previous one of the example, now crack is happening because of the removal of the oxide layer or because of the gas bubble generation or because of the anodic action that should be very clearly mentioned. So, that is why they are able to figure out what are the sources of the crack and why the crack is getting generated. So, it is overall a very significant we say by leveraging advanced signal processing techniques and neural network based analysis it offers insight into both the state of cladding process and presence of defect. Now, presence of defect this is something like a crack. Now, based on this we can do a timely adjustment, we can improve the coating and we can really train our neural network. So, that next time when we are going for automation it can be done automatically. Now, this is a what they have shown the two stages when we say cladding state recognition network as I say that they are treating separate way and then what is the output in this case they are the normal no nothing is to be done everything is optimized. Other one is that laser power abnormality that means laser power either need to be increased need to be decreased. Scanning speed abnormality maybe it needs to improve increase or decrease powder feed doing uh, abnormality similarly overlapping uh, red uh, abnormality because a layer need to be slightly overlapped also once so it is done and finally can uh, cooling time abnormality. So, they are detecting they are training this requires a lot of domain knowledge related to manufacturing. We can learn by entering in the manufacturing domain, but we are just giving example how do we analyze. So, what we say network model based on the tensor flow of course, they are using open source framework uh, which is available. Uh, it has they are using the python which is already core library is available. So, some people already have worked on this so they have utilizing this uh, um, python however, as a man uh, knowledge is concerned for the industries it may not work immediately, but we need to develop algorithm which can be much more useful in the future. Now, next one is a network compresses what is already mentioned they are using 1024 uh, into 1 node uh, time series and that need to be changed. Now, convolution and uh, there we know very well it has been uh, reduced to 30 to 1 and then uh, they uh, in a pooling they are using a 3 into 1 uh, this uh, uh, filter to uh, give a better result of the true extractive feature in the proper way. So, this is what and of course, as I say output layer contains the 6 nodes and the 6 nodes has been shown on this. Another one is a crack defect detection network this is a separately done. So, now here they are finding the flaws earlier it was 6 output now only 5 outputs the crack is not really required. So, we cannot see anything normal. Now, laser power to uh, creating crack, scanning speed creating crack, powder feeding is creating crack, overlapping rate is creating crack and cooling time is creating crack. So, hypothetically everything is fine, but when you do the fine tuning it there a major problem will be coming that time because there will be a lot of overlap 
and where the real machine learning algorithm execution will be playing more important role. So, what they have realized a crack defect diagnosis network dedicated to feature extraction of uh, particularly for the high energy because the crack is related to high energy signals only and then uh, they are trying to figure utilize optimize the depth and width how many neurons and how many oral layers that can be done by adjusting uh, the classification accuracy and uh, uh, trying to minimize the number of weight factors so that in future it will be easier. Network structure comprising in this case is input layer, alternative convolution and pooling layer, fully connected layer and softmax classifier. This, this classifier has been already used in previous slide also, but there is a kind of classifier and I already have covered in my earlier lecture. In this case, 5 nodes that has been shown very clearly, laser power to crack, scanning speed to crack, powder feeding to crack, overlapping rate to crack and over cooling time to crack. Now, finally, once the overall hypothesis is clear, they need to go for the experiment and then validate uh, the results. For that purpose, they kept uh, selected uh, colliding length of the 25 mm and then uh, they try to capture the utilizing the 5 megahertz data of course they tried up to 1 uh, megahertz but in this case they selected data 5 megahertz and then uh, how do we find a crack or no crack they use a penetration test there's one another test method NDT method which is in my video lectures also available on uh, this uh, testing method they use uh, they make a total 11 data set in one of my earlier lecture I mentioned we need to capture the images because the CNN images are important and in that image is made them they have made of uh, 11 folders one index is 0 and it, uh, last index is a 10 so that is all and the number of images which can be kept utilized is a uh, need to be seen even if suppose a 250 then it has to be 250 all. But in this case, they captured around 1500 and then they kept it. Of course, they defined uh, uh, train in manner that initially there is a normal stage, there is a 0, um, abnormality 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but without any crack. Similarly, abnormality 5 with a crack. So, that has been done and then uh, they analyze accordingly and then they mention very clearly when they are using the pre trained model they are getting only 71 percent accuracy when they are using other algorithm in one case uh, two parallel uh, neural network in one case only one neural network and this MLP stand for the multi-layer perceptron which is uh, the perceptron is the beginning when the neural network is started and then we are going with always a multi-layer it is not only one layer one hidden layer also will be there so multi-layer uh, perceptron uh, that has been done while in this case they have kept uh, SRD uh, this is a very good state recognition and correct uh, detect uh, that is a method they used they use for the two separate uh, algorithm and they tune this parameters based on the data they provided to the signals. So, this is a model training and then as I mentioned this method is what they proposed. Of course, there is a, some type of error in this paper they are written a method 3, but it should be method 2 and then uh, this is MLP 1, MLP 2 and CNN. You can see here there are two network in first and second case the two separate algorithm have been utilized while in third and fourth they treated only one algorithm. So, this is what in the, in the third case in this case comparison 3 input all the signal sample into trained multi layer uh, perceptron model and in the last one it is a what they say use uh, one trained uh, one dimensional trained uh, convolution neural network model which they picked up and directly used. Now, here they use a word B and that means a batch normalization basically the normalization is done to improve the training stability and increase the uh, conversion rate. This is uh, what they use uh, uh, confusion matrix for all the four cases. You can see the confusion matrix uh, they are mostly getting 100 percent 100 percent which is again a hypothetical we may not get 100 percent it may be 90 percent, 95 percent, maybe 97 percent. MLP 1, this is when they are using two algorithm, they are also getting reasonably good results 96.3 percent, 96.17 percent, 90 percent, 100 percent, 96.67 percent. So, they are getting reasonably good while these results are generally bad. So, what is the conclusion coming out? Whenever there is a need, we may go with a multiple CNN algorithm thinking only one CNN algorithm will give a results may not be correct. Every CNN algorithm for the different different stages should be different. So, here they are trying to optimize a coating process that uh, that algorithm needs to be different 
they are trying to detect their cracks in the coating that algorithm needs to be different a and b have been shown from that point of view both are giving good results when one only one algorithm results are not good so may not be utilized and finally there is the last slide we say that tcne they also utilize basically tcne is a visualization tool that's why we use our feature extraction visualization and then uh, they are able to see the all the features have been identified separately particularly for the day one they have proposed a model also uh, there is a some overlap in uh, this p with what is has been mentioned as mlp1 the second method uh, they are finding well in third and fourth are bad result because there is a lot of overlap uh, and uh, conclusion again comes better we go with a two separate algorithm if there are five different things to be done five different function need to be done we should have a more number of algorithms so in this case coating optimization one algorithm identifying cracks another algorithm quite possible we, when we go for the close feedback system we may require third algorithm but connecting these two algorithms there is a possibility and improvements are possible with this i say thank you for attending this lecture thank you